Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's how I feel today when I reflect on the goodness of God that he could send his son, Jesus Christ, to die for such a wretched person, a person such as me. I just bless the Lord that he looked down and despite who I was and despite where I was headed, he determined that he would put me in a different direction. I'm Bishop Hewell and Ahana, and welcome to another opportunity for us to look into the word with Bishop Hewell and Ahana. I want to speak on this topic today. He died, I live. He died, I live. When Jesus came into this world as a bouncing baby boy, those who were not aware of his purpose perhaps only saw him as another charming infant child born to his joyful parents. However, as he grew and began to walk in his purpose and mission, he not only turned heads, he changed lives, but he also set tongues wagging. He was no ordinary child, you see. He was certainly not ordinary in the same way we see the average child growing up in the community. Jesus was raised in a way that is aptly described in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. And the Bible says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in favor with God. Let me take it again. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, end quote. Even at this tender age, it was obvious that Jesus was going to be brought up in a way that would make him identifiable with all of the challenges human beings fail or face today. You see, no one would be able to say that Jesus could not identify with humanity because he was too much like God. I am glad that God's Son understands all of the troubles and the human experience that we go through. That whatever our issues are today, God understands. When Jesus came, Jesus experienced every temptation that we experience today. Yet he did not fall prey to his temptations or to the tempter. Hebrews 4, chapter, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Can I read that again for the sake of emphasis? My reference is Hebrews 4, 15, 16. Listen to it. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Thank God he knows what I feel. Thank God he can identify with what I feel. The passage continues, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. And so on the basis of this, the passage continues, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, this is very important. Why is this important? Because what the enemy wants us to do, whenever we sin, whenever we infract the laws of God, the enemy wants us to hide not only from those who will discover or come to know what we have done, but the enemy wants us to hide from God. He does not want us to come to God. He wants us to hide away in shame, in guilt, and a feeling of disappointing God. But the passage says to us, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may find or we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I remind us of our topic today. He died, I live. He, as in Jesus, died. I, as in Hugh and Hannah, live. Listen to it again. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. At all times, Jesus, while on this mission, Jesus, his mission was to pave the way 
for our reconciliation back to the Father. He was focused in on that. Nothing deterred him. No circumstance, no situation, no personality, nothing was a diversion for him. He was, he was laser focused on what his father called him to do. There was nothing redeeming about you and me that would even cause God to take a second look in our direction. Yet his love was such that he, despite who we were, this love came after us. His grace, his mercy came after us to demonstrate not only the love of God for us, but to demonstrate that God had a future for us. My friend, I do not know what your lot is. I do, not know, I do not know what your circumstances are. I do not know what your relationship is with you and God. What I do know is that God has a future for you. That can be a wonderful future. It can be one where you receive the advantages of a son, of an heir, if you adhere to what God is saying to you. Isaiah 53 and 6 put it so beautifully. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord had laid in him the iniquity or on him, the iniquity of us all. You see, there was nothing redeeming about us. We were not good. Some people were morally upright. Some people today do things in a pious way. And some people will never get in problems with the law of the land. They will not create any moral issues for themselves. But until the heart is given over to God, we are still alienated from him. And so hear the passage again, Isaiah 53 and 6. All we, you and me, us, have gone, or like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord had laid upon him, who him? Jesus Christ. The Lord has laid upon Jesus Christ the iniquity of us all. And I love how it is rendered in the New American Standard Bible. And listen to what it says. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall upon him. It, it, this is something that is so profound to even attempt to understand. I am guilty, but in steps, God through his son Jesus Christ and says, yes, you are guilty, but I am going to take the burden of that guilt I'm going to take the consequences of that gift upon me and I am going to be punished. I'm going to lose my life for you and all my Father God wants you to do is accept what I have done for you by dying vicariously, meaning dying instead of you. I want you to accept that. Try as we may. We cannot escape the fact that God is interested in us. As Jesus' life among the people of his day unfolded, he came across persons with varying needs. This is this Jesus now going toward the cross for you and me. He did not turn down these individuals. They needed their healings. They needed to be delivered. But there was something far more important to him than what they needed physically. They needed a savior. Yes, you want to be healed. Yes, you want more money. Yes, you want your family to come together. Yes, you want to see things change in a positive direction. But what we need more is a savior. Today, many are satisfied with the trappings of religion. They relish in the fact that they are church going. They are glad about the fact that their names are on the church's membership role. They will tell you how they have stayed out of trouble and how they have been good citizens of their country. And to be certain, thank God for good citizens and good citizenship. We need more of them. But as far as Jesus' mission to earth was concerned, this was not what God singularly had in mind. 
for us to live happily here after. What he wants for us is to accept the fact that we need a savior. Our sins placed us in a state of estrangement away from God. The price to be paid was too hefty for mere humans to satisfy. Man could not pay for his sins then, and he certainly cannot do so now. Only God, only God through Jesus Christ can make that way for you and me. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You can do all the work you want. You can follow a tradition all you like. You can say wonderful things and be applauded and lauded by humankind. But understand, by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of works. Do and do and do and do. You know what you get for the work we do down here? We get the attention of others. But as far as God is concerned, why work for something that has already been provided for you? Our sins required Jesus to go to the cross. He was rejected along the way. He was vilified as he ministered to thousands. He was labeled, as they would say in the Bahamian vernacular, everything but a child of God. This did not stop his forward movement to what, what was to be his ultimate sacrifice for you and me. Jesus just kept going. He just kept going. He just kept going. Yes, he had his encounters with the enemy, but he just kept forging ahead forging ahead. Why? Because the goal was to get to the cross. The goal was to ransom us. The goal was to be on that cross and three days later to be resurrected, to give us hope beyond this life, hope beyond our experience, and to know that what we go through now is nothing compared to what God has for us. Jesus performed miracles. He preached and taught vast audiences. He delivered those bound by the chains of, of cruel sins. Demonic forces were no match for him. He fed the hungry, those that came to listen to his ministry. And certainly they would have fallen ill and perhaps even passed had he not made an intervention in giving them something to eat. Little children were prayed over and adults were set free from the tyrannical clutches of sin's taskmaster, Satan himself. The dead were raised to life. And in the case of, the, of a distraught mother, her son was returned to her alive after being raised from the dead. But all of these wonderful events and the, and the facts that surround them pale in comparison to the essence of Jesus' ministry on this earth. He came that he might die for you and me. He came to be the price for our sins so that we may live. The Bible says to us in 1 John 2, 1 and 2, it says, My little children, these things I write unto you, that if he sin, that he sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate, which is the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Let me read it again for the sake of clarity. My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Verse 2 says, and he is the propitiation. He is the satisfaction, the price for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. See, this gospel has to be shared. In our world today, there are incursions in many parts of the universe. There is disharmony in many, many areas of the world. There's upheaval. There are things going on that, would, that you would cringe 
if you only knew the context of what has been happening in many instances. But despite all of this, the gospel comes to reconcile men and mankind back to God. The gospel comes to take out all of the, the, the vile and the anger and the hostility and the animosity that we humans have for each other. Scripture says, and he is the propitiation, the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And I can hear perhaps you saying to yourself, oh, but Bishop Hanan, I have done so many egregious things. Oh, Bishop Hanan, I have made a commitment to God many times before only to walk away from God shortly thereafter. Oh, Bishop Hanna, this is so hard to do. Oh, Bishop Hanna, it's rough. Oh, Bishop Hanna, Bishop Hanna, Bishop Hanna. But I say to you again, he is the propitiation for the sins of not only me, but for the entire world. Allow him to come in and your sordid past, that thing about you that make you feel as if I can't do this. I can't walk this road with God. Give all of that to him and watch him change the trajectory of your life. Why? This is so because Jesus, the eternal son of God, was the only one suitable to pay, to pay the price for our sins. He died that we might live. He died that we might live. Let me be more complete in my statement. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus lives. Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus lives. On the contrary, I was born a sinner, or I was born dead in sin and trespasses against God. But now, because Jesus died for me, I, who was dead, I now have been risen to newness of life in Christ Jesus. Let them banish you all they want. Let them demonize you all they wish. Let them bring your past up as much as they want. But know that whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Rejoice over the fact that God has changed your life. Rejoice over the fact that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 1 to 7. This is a fairly lengthy passage, and I'm going to exegete it as we speak. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. And so the same man, who was terrible, the same individual who drifted aimlessly in life, the same person who was absorbed by himself, who was absorbed by his successes, his possession, and all of the things that he called his, his position, that same person who came to Jesus Christ, the passage is saying, and you, had he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. In other words, he's forgiven you. He's given you a new lease on life. Wherein, in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What you are now, is a far cry from what you were. And what you were, many are still in that type of relationship outside of God. But the same God who changed you then and who was created for you, who you are now, is the same God who will change others. No, my friend, they lied to you when they said that you cannot change. You deceived yourself then you said, I just cannot do any better. This is my lot in life. 
I am bound to be this way. No, my friend, I am telling you that by the grace of God, he died, Jesus, so that you can live, confess your sins, confess your missteps, confess, confess, confess. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and watch your life take a complete turnaround in the opposite direction. This is God. This is God speaking for us. The Bible says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh. We behaved a certain way, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together by Christ Jesus. By grace are ye saved. Listen, it is saying that as bad as we were, even when we were in the doldrums of sin, God, by Christ Jesus, had this love for us and this grace that kept coming after us. Do not allow anyone to tell you that it's too late for you. Do not allow anyone to say that this generational curse exists in your family. And so this family is doomed to, to repeat one failure after the other. God's grace is greater. God's love is greater. My friend, my community, I do not know what you are suffering with today. But what I do know is that the grace of God is greater and more potent than the evil that we have done. Do not allow anyone to cause you to feel as if you've been disenfranchised by God and there is no help for you. The Bible says, and he had raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he may show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What is the passage telling us? The passage is simply saying that, you know, you look at people today, you hear their testimonies, and they sound so wonderful when you see them operating in ministry. And at times you say, well, I wonder where this person came from. I wonder what, what they did in the past, et cetera, et cetera. But not, it's not that, you know. What it is, is that where God has brought them from. God has brought them from. And as I said, whatever you have been languishing in, God can pull you from it. We are in the Easter season. We're in the time of Good Friday. Allow the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, allow the story to resonate with you. Read it again. And you will see where you are in that passage. You will see where you are in the narrative. No, not your name, but your deeds, your humanity, your sin. The fact that we've all come short of God's goodness and his grace. You will see that God not only had us on his mind, but that through Jesus Christ, he created this way out for us. And it is in this way out for us. He died and we can live. Remember earlier in the sermon we said, Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus lives again. We're going to pray in a short while. But I want you to take stock of your life. I want you to look back over your life. You may not be too happy or too pleased with what you see. But I want you to know that the God who sent his son Jesus Christ for you loves you so much that God is there waiting for you. I want you to know that he will give you newness of life. I want you to know that you can still live your best life. You may say, but my productive years are behind me. No one really pays attention to me. But God has a plan for you. God has, God has a way for you to live productively and to impact the kingdom of God, to impact this world for him. Oh, it is so wonderful 
when I can see persons who I know were going on the, down the downward road and I can see where they've made that turn through Jesus Christ and no longer are they bound by sin, no longer are they being held against their will, but they're living for Jesus Christ. And so I say to the person who's strung out on alcohol, you can live your best life. I say to the one who's been abusing drugs and illicit substance, even if you've been using over the, over the counter or prescription drugs that have made you now like a zombie, I say that you can live your best life and God can clean you up and clean you out and God can reinvent you and people will look at you and their mouths will drop open because they will recognize that this thing that has happened to you had to be by some other force. What other force? The grace and the power of Almighty God. I say to the one, you've been abusing your family. You've been abusing your wife, abusing your children, whether verbally, whether physically, psychologically, emotionally, however the abuse has visited upon them. You can live a new life in the name of Jesus Christ. I say to the person who is living under shame and guilt, even though your sins have been forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ, I am saying to you that God can wipe away the guilt of forgiven sins. And God can make you also to live a life of substance, a life of value. God has a plan for you. Be not deceived by the naysayers. Be not deceived by those who hate you and will disparage you and bring your past before you. Look to God, oh bless you, Jesus, and live abundantly. Put a smile on your face. Stride with confidence and the known that I can do all things through Jesus Christ. Know that I can smile again. I can lift my head. I can walk with confidence once again. I can have my children call me father or mummy, mother, and make me feel proud to know that God has changed me. I speak to a community right now. You may have been beset by crime and antisocial behavior and people and these things have created a scourge and a blight on your community. God can change your community. Revival can break out in your community. Those young men that seem to go the way of the gun and violence and seem not to have the capacity to reason things out because he lived, you too can live. He died so that we may live. He lives today so that we can have absolute and complete victory in the name of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? And Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, Lord, we come to you today. We bless you and we appreciate you. Great is your faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. At this time of the year, as we reflect on your Son's death, as we reflect on his resurrection, as we reflect on his ascension to heaven to you, we also reflect on the fact that he is alive in our hearts. He is alive in our emotions. He is alive in our communities, in our family lives. And so help us, Lord, to embrace every opportunity to live out this life and to demonstrate to others that it is worth the while serving your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you now, Lord, that you would save the backslider. You'll redeem those who come to you. Thank you that those who are discouraged, even the sick, you will heal and you will raise the newness of life. We bless you today in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you, my beloved. This is Bishop Hannah, and we've had a wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. I'm looking forward to our other time, for another time, then again we can connect in the Word. God bless you.